Okay, everybody, I'd like to uh, uh, throw some ideas out there for you or some information, some little tidbits. Um, I hadn't planned a talk, but I figured that uh, you might be interested to know a few things about Esri. I was interested before I went to work for the company, a little bit more about it. Um, to start off, um, how many of you know Arnold Schwarzenegger? How many of you know Arnold Schwarzenegger? Some of you don't know Arnold Schwarzenegger. Do you mean personally or just... Well, that's a, that, that, this is a, a second question. Yeah, so if I were to ask you to tell me about Arnold Schwarzenegger, you could tell me lots of things about him, right? Uh, his positive and his negative characteristics and his attributes. But then if I were to pressure you a little bit and ask you, do you really know Arnold Schwarzenegger personally? Have you talked to him personally? Have you visited his house? Do you know what he's really made of? Well, then probably no one here would be able to say that. So if you see where I'm going, um, I, I worked for many years. Uh, I'm an American by birth, but I've been in Spain for 21 years. So I'm a, I'm a GIS professor in Spain, and after uh, working on um, um, several different open source projects, my, my students were uh, um, part of the crew behind GBSIG in, uh, in Spain, which has been around for a while, and it's doing okay, running out of funding, unfortunately. Um, and they were also working with Esri technology. Why would they work with both? Because they wanted more opportunities, because our group still wants more opportunities for, for projects, for jobs, etc. So the research group in Spain, where I am, continues to work on both technologies. Um, why would I go over to the dark side? Why would I move to Esri, which is what I did four years ago? Um, I was offered a job by Esri in California um, to be the uh, education manager, to work with universities. I thought, well, okay, interesting. Um, and I thought, well, it's a free trip to California. I'll go and meet the people and see what happens. Well, when I went there, I found that I liked the people, and it's an interesting company, because I started hearing more details that I didn't know about the company. I thought, okay. Pretty interesting. So I did join Esri, and uh, one of the things I do is travel around the world, which is which is uh, very nice, very fun. And so uh, you know, I've got, gotten a chance to see universities uh, in many countries around the world. Um, so let me just throw some 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 facts out here, uh, things that I've learned uh, since I joined the company. Uh, who knows when the company was created, more or less? How long has it been around? Ten years, twenty years. Thirty more. 43 years, yeah, it's been around since 1969. So it's been around a long time for a technology company. Um, um, Intergraph was created the same year. Different types of, uh, of growth. Intergraph came from a bunch of guys who were building missile software, missile guided software for the military. Um, our company came from a guy, Jack Dangerman, who was a landscape architect and who likes trees and started doing environmental projects. So yeah, ESRI, Environmental Systems Research Institute. And then it grew. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that growth in, in, in a minute. Um, it's privately held, which means no stockholders, which means it doesn't have to answer to funny investment uh, organizations around the world. There's one guy and his wife who make the decisions based upon what they think is right. They don't always get it right, but, you know, but uh, it's interesting because these husband and wife team decides what they think is, um, what they think they should do and how they should invest. Revenues, $800 million per year. Is that a lot or a little? $800 million per year are the revenues. How many employees are there? How many employees are there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 2,700 employees in the United States. Um, so if you do the math, it's not a lot of revenue per employee. So if you were to talk to a lot of big companies, they'd say, that's not a, that's not a very profitable company. Um, its profits have risen slowly, but very gradually. So it's not one of these companies that's based on venture capital, where you suddenly you've got all these millions you can burn, and then sometimes you, you burn out, or sometimes you keep growing, right? So Google was venture capital, and went just up, up through the sky, right? Um, so privately held 800 million revenues, so it's about 160th the size of Microsoft is in terms of revenue. And of course, Apple's even a lot bigger than Microsoft these days, right? So it's a, it's a medium-sized company as far as IT companies are concerned. I said 2,700 employees, that's just in, in, uh, in, uh, in the United States. And then of course there are people in different R&D organizations or R&D centers around the world. So, I don't know, maybe 5,000 or something like that in total, but 2,700 employees in the States, of which, how, what's the percentage of uh, non-Americans, uh, non let's say, uh, non-foreign uh, or foreign workers, let's say? What's the percentage out of those 2,700 that are, that are coming from other companies or other countries? 10%, 20%, 30%? 50%. 50? Ooh, wow, not, 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 quite that, not quite that high, about 35%. About 35% of the employees there in the, in the, uh, the U.S. offices are from other countries. Uh, a lot, of, uh, a lot of Indian programmers, a lot of, uh, we've got some Ukrainian guys who have done a lot of the geostatistics. I mean, they come from all around the world. It's a pretty interesting uh, 
collection. I mentioned the R&D center. So there are research and development centers, ESRI research and development centers in Zurich, which is the, uh, the uh, procedural company, the, the company that ESRI bought recently, and they're the ones who created City Engine, all the 3D modeling stuff. So that's a, a research and development center. There's one in Beijing, where a bunch of guys are programming mobile applications. There's one in Edinburgh, which is where a lot of the cartographic stuff happens. Uh, there's one in Washington, D.C., which was uh, the GeoIQ uh, acquisition uh, last year. And so they're doing a lot of the web mapping, a lot of crowdsourcing, a lot of that sort of stuff. And they're also leading a lot of the open source uh, uh, initiatives from the Washington, D.C. office. And then recently in Portland, Oregon, on the other coast, um, there was an acquisition of a company called GeoLoki. If you're not uh, familiar with GeoLoki, they're doing really interesting things as far as uh, um, mobile tracking and geofencing and that sort of thing. So they're going to start doing a lot of the geo development on the, on the mobile side. Um, one of the things I was interested to find out is that nearly everyone in the entire company is paid hourly. That's something which is very strange for any company. Everyone works and gets paid by the hour. And, at, and every 15 days we go on the web and we say, okay, I did six hours in this category, and 19 hours in that category, and this many, this many hours flying, and this many hours in seminars. And, and you get paid when you're traveling. Okay? Esri is not, Esri does not pay very well in, in comparison with the Googles and the Microsofts of the world. But when you do lots of hours, you get paid for your hours. Right? And so you get the combination of these crazy people who like to do geo things and they're getting paid for all their hours. Consequently, people don't work 2,000 hours like Europeans do, they work 3,000 or 3,500 hours. They're working all the time. But you're, you're getting paid all the time. When you're on a plane, you're getting paid. If you're reading a manual in your bed before you go to sleep, you get paid. And then you declare honestly what you, what you did, and that's what you get paid for. And no one checks up on you, they say, okay, this guy says he worked 80 hours this week, okay, 80 hours. And you get paid hourly, even the bosses. Um, Jack Dangerman, okay, the founder of the company, um, he's supposedly one of the Forbes uh, you know, richest guys in technology or whatever, one of these Forbes billionaires, right? Supposedly, according to Forbes magazine, he's worth $3 billion. Um, that's a funny figure because since there's no stock, um, he's actually really uh, not worth anything on paper, right? Unless he sells the company, he's really not worth anything. So he's got some sort of he has some sort of um, portion of the revenues, but it's a funny figure that this that they're saying two billion, three billion, whatever. Well, it would depend. With a technology company, you never know whether you're going to be able to sell your company for a million or a billion, right? You've seen some of these crazy figures that just happen because of serendipity or because of good luck. So who knows? If he were to sell the company, he might get a billion or he might get five billion. We don't know that. But what's interesting is that you see the guy walking around the office and he, he walks around with no shoes on and he comes into work every day with a white Ford pickup truck because he still likes uh, to work with, with, with plants. So he has been responsible for planting millions of trees around the whole area and also uh, rocks. He really likes rocks. He's a landscape architect, and so we have a big campus with about 20 different buildings around in Esri, and he's responsible for selecting and planting and locating every tree and every rock. And I was there when he was putting in a new building a couple of years ago, and I came on the weekend on my bike, and there was Jack Danger supervising the guys taking these big boulders off of trucks and putting them down. And he would say, no, no, that one's backwards. And these guys were looking at him and saying, fucking boulder. No, no, no. He said, he said to the guy, I chose that boulder. Put it the other way, it's backwards. And so he's really hands-on, he's really there sort of uh, keeping track of things. And, uh, and so any projects that have to do, just so you know, any projects that have to do with trees, he'll fund it. Um, users, we don't really know how many users because there are all kinds of funny classifications in the database, but it's said that there are 350,000 organizational users. We don't know exactly how many desktops. 350,000 organizations, uh, small city governments, Big ministries, uh, big companies, the Starbucks, the Federal Expresses, all these big multinationals, um, uh, UNs and World Banks and all these big organizations. Um, so if you take the 800 million per year and divide it by the 350,000 organizations, what's the average organization paying per year to Esri? Do the math and it's about $2,200. Yeah, 800 million in revenue for everything, right? For training, for software, for professional services. Uh, 350,000 organizations, an average of $2,200 is what the organization is paying to Esri. Um, Jack invested uh, in 2012 $20 million, more or less, $20 million in content to publish this content up on the web. Last year we spent $20 million for content. 
you can get access to a lot of this content for free. You just have to get access to the rest endpoints. For, just to give you one example of the content, he purchased uh, 50 terabytes of GOI imagery and he put it up there for people to use using RTS Online. But you don't have to be an Esri client to, to, or user to, to get access to that information. You just need to know where it is up on the cloud and access the rest points. So a lot of people are integrating this base data the same way that we saw some examples here. Same way people are getting access to the Bing data or to MapQuest's version of OpenStreetMap or other versions of OpenStreetMap. So there's all this Esri coverage out there of imagery, street uh, topographic maps, etc., etc., and that costs a lot of money. So a huge investment in content. Um, let's see where I'm on my list here. Um, Jack donates millions every year. No one really knows how much. Mostly on land preservation. So you might ask, what's he doing with all his money? He's got no kids. He's got no family. Right? He invests his money in projects. There's a whole. You can imagine. Everyone's asking him for money. And uh, a lot of his money goes into land preservation. So there's just millions and millions of hectares of land around the world that he's helping to preserve. Mostly land along coastlines. So, so especially forested areas along coastlines. So that's one of the things that he really uh, is really into. Um, there are about 900 or 1,000 developers in Israel. Um, about 50% of them, and we haven't done an official survey, but if you look around, about well, 50% of them are Mac users. They're developing on the Mac. And in fact, ArcGIS runs on the Mac. A lot of people don't think it runs on the Mac. That's because people are not aware of the new runtime uh, platform. The new runtime platform has been, re has been rewritten from scratch. People used to have to use these Arc objects, which meant that you had to install a whole bunch of libraries and a whole bunch of big fat stuff, and you ended up with a fat application. And if you only want to do three things, mm, that wasn't a very good idea. So the runtime platform, which is new, is platform neutral in the sense that you run the code and then you decide, okay, I'm going to implement or I'm going to deploy for Android, or I'm going to deploy for Linux, or I'm going to deploy for Mac OS. So the runtime environment allows you to write this little uh, small footprint application. You create the, ex the executable and then someone just copies the executable over to their computer and clicks on it and it opens. It doesn't install anything. When you're done with it, you throw it in the trash can. Okay? It's new. A lot of people don't know about that. So that's a, a, allowing people to create not the big GIS, but the little GIS for any mobile device, for any tablet, for any Mac. Um, so if you got somebody who wants to do three things, you write your code on top of this runtime and you just get that little executable out there. And if they want a fourth, app, a fourth thing that your application doesn't do, okay, you rewrite it and you add a form. When it gets to be too big, eh, probably not the right platform. Right? So a lot of people don't know about that. Uh, so a lot of Mac users around and uh, people find that uh, uh, curious. Um, the Esri SDI solution, the Geo Portal, is, is open source. Um, anybody know what the licensing is? What's the license on the Esri Geo Portal? Is it Apache? Apache 2.0, yeah. Apache 2.0. And I'm forgetting the exact history behind it. You know, there are a thousand different licenses. There is a reason for choosing Apache 2.0, and I think if you, if you Google around, you'll find out uh, why that is. There's a, a Dutch guy who's in charge of making that happen and publishing everything up on GitHub. His name is uh, Martin Hogeveg. Martin Hogeveg is the SDI guy who's behind uh, um, open sourcing the Geo Portal and getting that out there, and so uh, that's something that a lot of people um, find interesting to play with. Um, the Geo Loki uh, acquisition that happened in 2012, this small group of Portland, Oregon, um, run by this brilliant uh, woman named um, uh, Amber Case, she's like 27 years old and just sort of setting the world on fire, doing lots of really interesting mobile stuff. Um, why did they join Esri? I think that's an interesting story there. Why did they decide to join Esri? Um, and they were so-called, quote-unquote, acquired by Esri. Um, she's published some interviews in the, in the various portals on the web, and she said, well, we had all these great ideas, but you know what? It's a real pain in the ass finding users, and we're spending all of our time doing all this sales stuff and trying to get users, trying to get users. And you know what Esri gave us? 350,000 organizational users. They gave us our user base. And they allowed us to stay in Portland and do our thing. So that's a new tendency. Before it used to be that as we said, okay, we're going to take you on board, you're going to come and sit in an office in California and you're going to do our thing. In this case, they said, okay, Amber, you keep your people there, keep doing good stuff, and we're going to give you access to 350,000 um, organizational users. So now, they're, now they have room to grow. Now they don't have to go to venture capital. right? Now they don't have to sell their souls and have some guy come in and control their company in exchange for 
a small pile of money. In this case, they've got money that they need operationally to keep on going forever. So they didn't just cash out. They didn't just take a big pile of money and go away. They said, okay, this guy, Jack Ingerman, is going to allow us to do our thing. He's going to give us our, our cash flow. So in that case, I think it was a good match. Um, as he's been doing a lot with Ushahidi, we've seen Ushahidi mentioned a, a few times. Um, we've provided uh, financial donations to Ushahidi, um, and we created uh, for the desktop platform, for the RTS desktop platform, an extension, which you can Google and you can find. You add the extension to your RTS desktop, and it allows you to import the Ushahidi data, which is basically just points. So there's a lot of things that Ushahidi can't do because it's limited mostly to data points. So it allows you to bring in the data points from any Ushahidi project, and then do your cool geoprocessing and do heat maps or creating or any kind of geoprocessing that they can't do and you create something cool and then you feed it back to Ushahidi. So it allows you to be an intermediary and to uh, add value to the Ushahidi data. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with OpenStreetMap, the project. We've uh, made financial <coughs> donations to keep the project running. We've provided servers to OpenStreetMap. Um, we have an editor for OpenStreetMap, also for the desktop platform, which allows you to take your shape files or your geodatabases and massively upload them and contribute them to OpenStreetMap. That's on one side. And on the other side, I talked about all this, uh, this content. If you go to like RTS Online, or if you look at the various ways to access the Esri content, one of the base maps in all the products is, uh, is OpenStreetMap. So OpenStreetMap is available as a base uh, data layer, so it's for consumption, but it's also with the editor for contribution to the project. So that's been interesting. Um, Esri's contributed over the years to keep Frank Warmerdam functioning. You know Frank? Oodle or GDAL, however you want to pronounce it. Frank's been working on GDAL for, for many years now. We've provided funding and we've, we've provided requirements for it. Yeah? Of course, we've got GDAL within RTS. All the, all the systems have GDAL within, within their systems, uh, under the hood. And so we've provided requirements to him and we've been funding him just like lots of other agencies have. And now, of course, he's gone off and worked for a big company. But uh, that's something which a lot of people don't know about. Um, a, a high percentage of our users are now using Postgres because we've got full Postgres support. So a lot of people have abandoned uh, Oracle or whatever. Still have a lot of uh, uh, SQL Server users, but anyway, the, the, the base of, uh, of um, Postgres users is growing quite quickly. Um, there's a startup program that a lot of people don't know about. There's a guy named Miles Sutherland. Miles Sutherland is a Kiwi, he's a guy from New Zealand who's been with us for a while. He lives at the beach uh, near Los Angeles, and he's in charge of little startup companies because there was a problem that Esri had three levels of partner, uh, three, three partnership levels, silver, gold, and, and platinum, or whatever it was, and uh, the, the little guys working at home or working in the garage said, I don't have any interest in jumping up this high. Too many requirements, too many expectations for me. And so people have been asking us for many years now, don't you have something for the little guys so we can just start, you know, get started, and if we like what we're doing, and if we like the relationship, then we can move up to a higher level? So that's happening. So Miles Sutherland is a guy who's approaching little small startups and individuals to provide them with a startup package. And that's access to the technology, access to the cloud storage, um, mentorship, uh, is a, a package for three years without any cost. If the, uh, if the project or if the company starts to produce revenue, then there's a revenue sharing model. And you reach an agreement, you know, once it starts to produce revenue, you know, X percent for Esri and X percent for you. The same kind of deal you reach with your cellular phone operator or any kind of platform uh, providers. And if there's no revenue, well, then there's nothing to go, right? So that, that, that's being rolled out now. There's a, a, a program for non-governmental agencies, so for NGOs. There are more than 40,000 NGOs that have taken advantage of that and not getting exactly free software, but it's very, very cheap software. So they're getting a super discount on software on the order of like $100 for an RJS or that sort of thing. So more than 40,000 NGOs have grabbed onto that. So if you're working with NGOs, the guy there, his name is David Gatston. He's in charge of NGOs around the world and he's traveling all the time. He's now in uh, Tanzania doing things. Um, another thing you might not know, I'm not sure, maybe we're like on number 25 or something like that. Another thing you might not know is that we've got a huge contract uh, to uh, help eradicate polio in uh, Nigeria because, of course, polio has come back to Nigeria. And so the Gates Foundation contacted us to work with them to send thousands of people out into the field with mobile mapping to uh, reach all the different immunization stations and make sure that we're covering the entire country because the Gates Foundation is really serious about public health. And when they heard about polio, they said, okay, we're going to throw $100 million at it and we're just going to wipe it out. 
We're not going to talk to the government. We're not going to form a committee. No, we're just going to go and spend money and do it. So we're working with them to go and uh, collect a bunch of data out of the field and make sure that they're immunizing the people that they need to immunize. So something you might not have known about. Do people know about the home use license? The Israel home use license? A lot of the distributors are not saying too much about it. There's a full Art, uh, uh, RGIS desktop license for home non-commercial use for $100. You just have to Google it. For $100, you get RGIS with extensions for use at home. If you want to do something commercial, we go through other channels. If you want to do something with NGOs, you use NGO licenses. A lot of people don't know about that. Uh, I work with universities, so I'm the education manager uh, globally. Um, I work with how many universities do you think have ESRI software? More than 8,000. More than 8,000 universities. Um, from the top universities, Harvard's got a whole bunch of RGS stuff, down to the smallest universities in Burundi and Haiti and other places, where we've made donations. Where I have total flexibility to make donations, and so we sell the software for what people can pay. And so Harvard pays full price, and Burundi pays zero. And we've got people all, you know, all the way in the middle. Just a cheap question. Yeah. What's the possible home usage of it? What's that? What's the possible home use? What's the possible home use? Uh, people who have access to the software in their job, they want to do things at home. Training, for example, is the number one thing. People say... So that's still allowed even if it's connected to their day job, in a way. What's that? I mean, it's still connected to their job, so... Um, sure. no, normally, yeah. yeah. It's allowed by the license. Sure, yeah, yes. yeah any, any sort of non-commercial use. Yeah, a lot of people want, want to have extra hours. A lot of people have access to the software X hours during the day, and then someone locks the door. Or, you know, and they want to have extra hours to do things. Or, or training is the, the number one. They want to get up to speed on the new version or whatever. Some people are using some old version in their work and they want to say, hey, what does this version 10.1 do? So they get the home use thing. Um, um, summer internships. We have 50 paid summer internships in California every year. A lot of students don't know about that. And so uh, there's a web page uh, through the career section where you go and check out uh, the availability of different internships. And so we've got 50 uh, internships. And we get about 1,200 applications every year. So we try to find the best 50 to fit the, the needs of uh, the different projects each summer. Uh, Are they paid? Excuse me? Paid? They're paid, yeah. Yeah, paid. Not a huge amount. They pay around $25 an hour, something like that. Not bad for a student. Enough to, enough to live in California and do their thing. Um, we donate a, a lot of licenses. I talked about that at the university level and NGO level and that sort of thing. Also, we donate thousands of books every year. There's the Esri Press book series, and so we send books all over the place, and uh, so that helps a lot of uh, people training opportunities and that sort of thing, but don't have funding for, for full courses. Um, yeah, there's an OGC technical committee meeting this week that ESRI is hosting in the ESRI headquarters, so perhaps you didn't know that, that's another little tidbit. So the, ESRI, the OGC meeting, the technical committee meeting, and then today the uh, program committee meeting is being held at ESRI's uh, headquarters. Uh, so people think there's this love-hate relationship between OGC and, 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 and ESRI. ESRI's fine with OGC, as long as our, uh, as long as our users require compatibility or, or support for certain of the interfaces. There are a million different OGC interfaces, approved and not. If people ask for them, and enough people ask for them, well then we support them. But we don't just implement all OGC just because. Some of them are redundant with some other services that we offer that are frankly more sort of tuned to what the users are looking for. So a good example is WMS. It's great as a sort of lingua franca, bottom level uh, interface to paint a, a picture on the screen. But if you've got a server that does more than that, well, you don't go that route. You know, you, you use the capabilities of your server. And Geo Network and all these others are doing the same thing. When they can offer better than WMS, they do it. If that's the only thing you got available, well, you use it. So that's that's kind of our position there. Um, probably some of you know Andrew Turner, the guy from GYQ, who's uh, been working on uh, uh, web mapping for many years now. He's now part of the team. And he's the one now who's leading the effort to migrate as much as our software as possible to GitHub. So if you, if you Google Esri GitHub, you're going to find there's a new site there, and a lot of the stuff that can be open sourced is being migrated there. And so um, I think our position, and of course, if you talk to different people, you might get different positions. I think the Esri position open source is that there's this closed platform upon which people are creating all kinds of things, and they always have. So you do a little something in Python, or you create a new extension, or you do whatever you want. A lot of this, a lot of the, the second tier level is all being open source these days. Um, 
some partners, of course, have created an extension. They think they can sell, and so they're going to keep it closed. But a lot of the extensions are being open sourced, and that's the way that uh, we want to do it is through GitHub. And so you'll see a lot more uh, software there. Um, something to keep in mind is that um, Esri, like many medium large uh, organizations, um, we, we tend not to create software speculatively. We don't have a bunch of people saying, hey, look what I created this weekend. Hey, I'm going to try this. Which is what a lot of people do when they're at home, right? You've got this creative juices going, and a lot of the stuff we're seeing here is fantastic. It's, it's kind of a different model when you have an established company. And you, but frankly, you don't have time to be playing around. Let's see what happens if we do this. Everything comes from user requirements. So from time to time, we get a criticism. Oh, is not supporting whatever. Where are the user requirements? We can't support it if one guy starts screaming, oh, they don't have this. But when there are a few organizations that demand WMS support or any other support, well, then eventually it happens. So that's something which I think is interesting and something which I didn't really think much about because I came from the university world where we do whatever the hell we want. And I was working on open source projects. Hey, look what I did this weekend. Um, and then you get into this other area. Whoa, okay. Um, you know, things really go against requirements. And I think it's something for people to think about when they create a, even a small company. Um, going against the, the, the real requirements. I think Mark said in his presentation, you need to know really what the user wants, not just think you know what the user wants. You have to really figure out what the, where the pain points are, where the needs are, and start delivering that. And then you have maybe the luxury of doing other things around that. Um, almost finished here. Um, it might be interesting for you to know that most of the Esri distributors are 80, 80 different distributors around the world uh, covering different countries. Most of them are small, independently owned companies. And that's different from the Indographs and the Microsofts and that sort of thing. So if you go to a Microsoft office in this country, it's very, very heavily dominated by the Microsoft home office. The Esri distributors are basically local companies. Here it came from Telespazio. In other uh, countries it came from some small a software company that decided to start representing Esri and then became an Esri office. Um, therefore, um, there's a lot of local employment that's being created, a lot of local revenue that's being created. So don't think that all the money is going back to California. A lot of it stays in the individual offices. And uh, in, in, in that sense, Esri is the largest employer of GIS uh, uh, people in Europe. Yeah, Not to say that they're California employees, they're local employees, but the Esri family, let's say, and distributors are by far the, the largest employer. Um, some final notes. Um, Jack Dangerman started with $1,500 from his parents to start his company. It's always been really organic growth. Jack Dangerman hates venture capitalists. Whenever he talks to people who sometimes ask him for advice on business, he says, don't talk to these guys. Don't get involved with that shit. And, and he has a funny story. He says, when we started, my wife told me, Jack, we're going to live in our car and we're going to eat beans. Yeah? And unless we have a little bit of revenue, we're not going to invest. You know, we're not going to take loans, we're not going to get involved with our shareholders. And that's what they've done. A little bit of growth every year. Very organic and very slow growth. So that's the advice he always gives to young people. Don't get involved in this crap. You know? Start small. Don't think you have to have big infrastructure and fancy offices and all that. Start small and then just keep growing. And another piece of advice he always gives people is that you need to spend one third of your time getting business, one third of your time doing it, actually creating what you're creating, and one third of your time trying to get paid. And he said, a lot of people aren't very good at all three of them. A lot of people are really good at doing things, but not very good at getting paid, or not very good at getting the business. And so they kind of go around in circles, and they don't progress. So I think that's an interesting you know, lesson that he gave us as well. One third sounds like a lot of effort to get paid. Some of you know that you get involved in government agencies, and it might be a year or two before you get paid, or if ever, right? And uh, what they tell you they're going to do is different from what actually happens at the end of the project. So it's, uh, it's an important one. So uh, I think that was around 37, and hopefully some of those were things you didn't know. Now I'm happy to take comments, criticisms, questions, whatever you want. The floor is yours. Anything? Don't be shy. Has this really considered contributing to open source projects like QGIS? Has as we considered contributing to open source projects such as QGIS? Um, probably, um, but not to my knowledge. I say probably. It's like if you ask, uh, are Americans doing whatever? Yes, there's so many of them. Probably one of them is doing it. Um, QGIS, I think, is 
I'm not sure how interesting that is. QGIS um, duplicates a lot of the desktop functionality, um, and I'm not sure it's novel enough. I think that with open source projects that are really contributing something extra, I think that those are going to be more interesting for others to contribute to. I mean, we need to be frank, a lot of the open source projects are sort of copying commercial functionality and then, fr and then freeing up the software. So you get, you know, whatever, you know, MySQL. 20% of the functionality are Oracle, but that's the 20% that you need, and it's open and, and, it's, and it's nice to get your hands on it, right? It's not innovative, right? It's sort of replicating what you can get with an Oracle or a MySQL or an SQL server, but it's open and so it's more flexible and it's more fun to play with. So I would, I would think that it would, it would invest in projects that are sort of improving the platform and not duplicating some of its functionality. I think QGIS is great stuff, but I mean, if I already got an RTS desktop, I'm not sure, you know, why we want to do things there. Keep in mind, not everybody's a developer. Yeah? When you're a developer, you have a little bit of a different mindset. Like, oh, if you give me that code, I can do great things. Some people are like, hey, I gotta get my job done. I need to make this map. Or this desktop product is this one little piece in my big in my big puzzle. So it doesn't really matter to me what that piece is. You know, I got this other stuff to do. I know, and I'm not coming at it from the point of view of the developer, coming from a business perspective. Yeah, everyone nowadays has something that can give them location. And you know, you could see a market being created around location. But I don't think it's feasible for one company to effectively have a monopoly on the market. And I think the same mapping by the other people is sort of falling away slowly, just through their own business practices. A lot of the historical competitors have not exactly gone away. They've re rebranded themselves. No, so, no, so if you ask MapInfo, they'll tell you that they're not a GIS company. They're a location intelligence company or whatever, and they work with certain niches. And we'll go head to head with them. They'll beat us in certain niche areas, right? <coughs> and Indograph has decided, no, we're not a GIS company. We work on infrastructure and government, whatever, right? And, you know, in that area, well, they're, they're very strong competitors. So I think... But in that case, then, yeah. within the desktop GIS, yeah. Yeah, you could say, well, we want to help facilitate this market and make it grow. So, potentially having a competitor in the same way that Microsoft put their money into Apple uh -huh. a few years ago, right. well, a bit more than a few years ago, yeah. ultimately that helps the market grow. So, is that something, I, I'm playing devil's advocate here as well. So. Yeah, and I'm trying to help you, but I, I don't really see the, I mean, I'm not sure that the QGIS example well, QGIS, is a good one. QGIS, well, QGIS, 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 I mean, that, desktop GIS isn't going to go away, but that's, I, don't, I don't think where you want to focus these days, do you? You know, that's not where we want to focus these days. We've got a lot of hardcore people who are using the desktop, but that's not going to go away. But take a look at the press releases and go to the conferences and all that. It doesn't talk about desktop. Right? That's not where you want to be these days. Right? There are already a bunch of different options. If you want to edit your data, then you've got to do something with it, right? You want to share it, publish it, get it out to mobile devices. Uh, you connect with the crowdsourcing world. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff out there, right? And so I would say there's where things have already happened, right? So why, you know, why did they get involved with GOIQ? Because GOIQ was doing interesting stuff with crowdsourcing, with publishing data on maps, you know. And, and that's where as we saw, okay, there's a place where we can grow, right? That's not our core competence, you know. And rather than grabbing these guys and forcing them to, to work inside of our, uh, you know, in, in our shop, Maybe they wouldn't flourish doing that. So it, what we do is we work with them. I don't know what the deal was, but it was, they made them a similar deal to the GeoLoki deal. They said, you guys are doing great stuff. We want you to work with us. Stay in DC, stay in your offices. Um, you be in charge of this new R&D center. Keep doing the great stuff that you're doing, right? And I mean, these guys, you know, why did they agree? I think they thought, well, you know what? You know, this is the, this is the breath of air that's gonna get us out to all these thousands or hundreds of thousands of users is going to give us the scalability that we want. The alternative would have been for Sean and for, for Andrew to, you know, to, to take the risk capital, right? To take somebody's millions and go that route, right? But they didn't go that way, they went this other way, and so it's kind of a fuzzy middle ground, right? Yeah. So, so, so that's where it is growing. Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to take the floor too. Anyway, no. You mentioned, I think, a satellite cloud set that is free. Yeah. Could you summarize the terms of use? Uh, well, a whole bunch of uh, fine print. It's all on the web. Um, 
there are terabytes of Landsat uh, data from uh, four different time periods. You can do all the change detection, all that, all virtual Landsat data available. Uh, there's a whole bunch of GUI imagery, Econos and other platforms, it's all uh, made available. Um, yeah, if you Google around, you'll find how you access it, you'll find the, you'll find the rest endpoints, and then if you Google around, you'll also find terms of usage. And uh, um, the terms of usage are going to be similar to what you're going to find in the big world and in the, in the Google world, that is for non-commercial use, for research use, do whatever the hell you want. For commercial use, fine up to a certain limit, and then we're going to send you a reminder that, well, you should talk to somebody about licensing it. So, similar to the Google stuff. Well, you know, if you don't, that, what about like, the being uh, like OpenStreetMap is uh, the, the imagery in the tweets? Um, well, OpenStreetMap well, is using the Bing map uh, only because they hired the OpenStreetMap guy, and when he came on board at Microsoft, he probably said, this is one of my conditions. You have to donate a bunch of imagery to my project. And uh, so it's a special relationship, right? And uh, you know, Esri uses Bing, uh, the Bing images also. We have to pay Bing. We have to pay a license to Bing. And so that confuses our users and confuses us as well. Which is why I think that Jack is now buying his own imagery. So I think he's going to eventually cut the cord with Bing and say, you guys do your own thing. But, you know, you know he's got similar issues. You know, Jack's got similar issues than, than anyone, that anyone has. Um, you want to get access to your data the way you want it, when you want it. And he's probably you know, not happy with being dependent on Bing, so he's you know, eventually going to cut that cord and he's going to uh, provide his own imagery that he can source himself and decide what he wants and how often he updates and that sort of thing. I guess, hopefully, hopefully I answered your question. No, 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 as far as terms of use, yeah, it's all, it's a summary. Can you come over integration or integration with uh, the R software? You know with R, yeah. Well, there's not a formal integration with R, but a thousand people are out there doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, the, the, the integration path with R is Python. Yeah? Python. Yeah, Python. I mean, Python is the de facto extension language within ArcGIS. Uh, platform and, uh, and the same with R. Yep. So you do all the integration with Python, and you feed your data out to R, and you do all the fantastic geostatistical stuff, and then if you want to look at the results as a map, you bring it back. If not, you have all your black and white answers, and you move on. Yeah, a lot of our users. Uh, absolutely. Um, and, and a lot of other packages out there, you know, open source packages. You know, people are writing the writing the bridges, going out and doing something interesting, a model or something like that, groundwater modeling, and all a lot of environmental stuff. You go up to the model, you crank away, you do things, and then if you want to bring your points back into, you know, create beautiful cartography or publish them to the web, well, then you do that. So it goes out. Good question. All right. Any other questions you want to ask me privately, or whatever? I'm uh, available, and I'm, uh, I'm enjoying the event. All the good stuff happening. So. Uh, in the next uh, day and a half. All right.